Hi there, this is a lecture for GCSE Sociology um, students looking at how to evaluate research methods. Um, so when evaluating research methods, you have to discuss the strengths and weaknesses um, of that method using uh, the issues that we're going to discuss here today. Um, if we look at that acronym P-E-V-R-R, what do those letters stand for? Um, hopefully you can remember those are the things that you'll use to evaluate the method. Um, you'll have to answer exam questions on how useful a particular method is and you will use those um, uh, practical, ethical, validity, reliability and representativeness issues to decide whether it is or isn't useful. So the first one I want to talk to you about today is ethical issues. Um, for a bit of research to be ethical in sociology and other subjects, um, no one should be harmed. Everybody should walk out of the research in the, exactly the same physical and psychological condition uh, as they started it. So no one should be physically hurt or emotionally upset by being taking part in the research. Uh, the British Sociological Association sets out the ethical guidelines for research. And if you don't follow those guidelines, you can argue that research is unethical. But it is quite complex to get 100% ethical research. So the different issues to think about, um, first one will be informed consent. So you, if you just write consent, you won't get the full credit. You must say informed consent, uh, because this means people are told exactly what the research is about, um, the aims of the research, uh, what's going to be done with the research when it's published, for example. So they have a full idea of what's being researched and what's going to happen with that data. Okay. Uh, the next issue um, might be something called the right to withdraw. Participants should be made aware that they can stop taking part at any stage of the research for it to be ethical. Um, or they can sort of do um, a partial withdrawal. They might say, well, actually, I'd rather not answer that question in a questionnaire or an interview. So they might not withdraw fully, but they might just refuse to answer certain questions because they might upset them or they feel uncomfortable disclosing that information. Um, you need to be aware of power imbalance issues in research. Um, often it's the researcher who holds more power or authority than the participants. So if a researcher is researching children, for example, because of the age difference, they have more status and power. Uh, that might mean the children feel um, pressured to take part or pressured to answer in a particular way. Um, likewise, the same issue can apply to adults, uh, adults with mental health issues, um, uh, patients in hospital, or the example here is prisoners. Uh, they may feel they have no choice but to have to take part or feel that they have less status than the person asking the questions, which might even affect their responses, which is also a validity issue as well. Um, so, yeah, like I mentioned, no psychological or physical harm to participants. Participants should always feel and be safe. Uh, taking part in the research should do them no harm. Um, it shouldn't cause distress, stress, financial or physical harm. Uh, so, for example, no one should lose their job by taking part in, in a particular bit of research. Um, and quite often, in order to make research ethical, um, researchers will offer um, sort of counselling after the research to kind of mitigate any problems that might have kind of come up as a result of some of the questions that might have been asked. Um, debriefing. Um, this is kind of part of that possible therapy. Um, so you must debrief your participants afterwards, particularly when a sensitive topic is covered. So things like domestic violence. Uh, the researchers must uh, speak to the participants afterwards to check they're OK and support should be offered if they're not. So that will be the therapy that will hopefully prevent any psychological or physical harm. Um, Keeping the research anonymous is really important. Uh, uh, if it's anonymous, um, it won't have uh, people's personal information on there, like their names, addresses, their ages, for example. Um, this information must be kept confidential, um, so not shared with the public domain, not shared with other researchers, not shared with other participants, for example. Okay, so keeping uh, research anonymous. Uh, and a final one to think about is something called guilty knowledge. Now, this doesn't actually uh, show up in the GCSE curriculum. It's on the A-level curriculum. Uh, this might be where, in some cases, uh, a researcher will see something illegal or find out illegal information maybe about their participants. Um, and then they're, they're in a bit of what's called a catch-22 because they need to keep it confidential because reporting it would actually harm their participants. Um, so they're being ethical by keeping it confidential because they don't want to harm their participants. But they are now in possession of guilty knowledge, um, which is an ethical issue. OK, you know, should they be reporting that information to the police if they're working with students who are truanting or, or skiving off school? Should they be reporting that to the schools, for example? 
um, but that would possibly harm the participant or get them into trouble. Uh, the next issue I want to talk to you about is validity. Um, and this is essentially the question of whether the research has actually uncovered the truth. Okay, have they got to the truth of the matter? Um, so all sociologists want to find out the truth of social life. Um, but different sociologists have different views on exactly what is considered truth. Um, so we want to find out the truths because that helps us understand how society works. And we can use those sort of discoveries to say, oh, look, you know, I've identified this pattern. I've identified this truth through my research. We need to do something about it to make society better. Um, some methods are far more valid than others. So some methods are better at getting to the truth. Um, but in all case in cases, if participants aren't honest in their replies or if they alter their behaviour, the validity is lowered. So the things that can get in the way of validity include um, an unnatural setting. So um, if you are, for example, interviewing people in um, uh, a boardroom or a, a formal environment, they might change their behaviour. Um, if you um, give, if, if you take people for an observation and you tell them you're going to be observing them in, and you say, Let, I want to observe you in a shop, that's not their natural setting, perhaps so they might change their behaviour. So being somewhere different can really change people's behaviour because they know they're being researched. Uh, another issue with validity can be when you give restricted responses. So this is only for research methods that involve closed questions, uh, and that would mostly be on questionnaires. But of course, in interviews, you can sometimes get closed questions. Uh, so I might say in an interview or a questionnaire, um, how are you feeling today on a scale of one to five? You're only allowing someone to say, um, oh, I feel two or I feel three. You're not allowing people to really explain their feelings. Um, likewise, uh, you might ask someone, um, do you feel that you had have had a good education? Uh, they're just allowed to say yes or no. Uh, and again, it doesn't really allow them to fully explain their responses. So it's not en entirely true. Um, being aware of being researched and what the research is about. So if participants know they're being researched, uh, they're probably going to change their responses or change their behaviour because they know that they're part of a research project. And this can be made even worse if they know exactly what the research is about. So if you want to be really ethical, you get informed consent. But by doing that, you tell them exactly what you're researching. So if I sat down with um, some students um, and I said, you know what, I'm uh, investigating bullying at school um, and I want to find out if girls do it more than boys. Um, students are probably going to change their responses because they know that I'm researching bullying. Uh, they're probably, uh, which is linked to social desirability that I'm going to come to in a second, they're probably going to deny being bullies or not being aware of bullies. Um, if they're girls, they might want to say it's boys that do it. Boys might want to say girls do it. All because they're aware of what the research is about. So I'm no longer getting to the truth of what people think and feel. Okay, Instead, I'm getting responses based on their worries, if you like, about what the research is about and perhaps what I might think of them. Um, so you've also got what's called peer pressure or the researcher effect. Okay, So peer pressure, hopefully you're aware of, uh, when uh, friends might put pressure on you to act in a way or respond in a way. Um, that would be relevant in um, observations, for example. Um, so observations in the classroom, observations in uh, your natural life, observations in a, a leisure centre, observations in the street. Um, if you're with your friends, um, they might put pressure on you to act and behave in a particular way, whether you know you're being researched or not. Um, and also it's quite a common issue in the group interview setting. So if it's a group interview, peer pressure quite often uh, can be used to put pressure on different people to make responses based on what their friends think. Um, and there's also what's known as the, the researcher effect, where the way the researcher asks questions might lead the person to think, oh, I don't think they'd like that response. So if I was interviewing someone about sexism and I said, oh, uh, what do you think um, about equal pay um, for men and women and how, how awful it is that women aren't paid the same? Uh, the person's probably going to say, oh yes, it, yeah, it's dreadful because they can tell from my question that I'm not very happy about unequal pay for women, when really they might think, oh, you know, I think they are paid quite fairly. Um, there's also the Hawthorne effect, um, which only applies to observation. Uh, so if um, a group are being observed and they know they're being watched, that's what's known as the Hawthorne effect. Oh, sorry, they change their behaviour. That's what's known as the Hawthorne effect. Okay, um, it comes from the name of the factory 
uh, where they um, hired some researchers to find to try and increase productivity. Um, the researchers couldn't think, find anything conclusive, uh, but they noticed that in the two weeks that the research was happening, productivity went up, and they concluded it was because workers were being watched by the researchers. So that's why it's called the Hawthorne effect. That's only for observation. It's not for questionnaires. It's not for interviews. Okay, it's just for observation. Then there's social desirability, which I mentioned before. So social desirability is when someone will respond to a question or a, a research scenario um, because they want to impress either the researcher or possibly, again, their peers. Uh, they might want to appear, you know, if it's a group of lads, for example, they might want to appear more hard and more deviant. So they might act up to their peers because it's socially desirable. Or, you know, perhaps they want to impress the researcher by emphasizing how hard they work, how much homework they do and how on time they are. So they might lie about those things because they think, oh, that's the better way to behave and I want to impress this person. That's social desirability. Final one I just want to mention to you is um, about the researcher getting too close to participants and losing objectivity. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as going native. Um, so if a researcher spends a lot of time with a group, um, um, you know, this is normally for things like unstructured interviews, um, uh, participant observation, if they spend a lot of time with them, getting to know them, or they come back and they interview them maybe regularly throughout the year, they actually end up becoming quite close to that person possibly and becoming almost like a friend of them and they might lose their objectivity. They might not see some of the things they do as problematic, for example. Uh, they might uh, prefer to see that person in a good light, so they stop being objective, which is a problem. So they're no longer value free. So if we use those points to quickly evaluate unstructured interviews and their validity, um, so unstructured interviews um, are much more like relaxed conversations, okay? Um, it can be, uh, it's a good unstructured interview if you manage to interview people in the most natural setting that you can manage, um, but that's not always possible. You might have to interview them in um, offices, for example, if, if that's what all you've got available. Um, a good idea might be to take them to um, a coffee shop, for example, to interview them, um, or, you know, maybe interview them in their own home, perhaps, because those are much more natural settings where they might be much more relaxed, okay? Um, but um, generally, because they're unstructured and they flow like conversations, they're much more valid unstructured interviews because um, people forget they're almost being interviewed and just chat to the, the, to the researcher, so they're more likely to be open and honest. Um, unstructured interviews generally have open questions, so the responses aren't restricted. They can talk very openly and at length about the things that are important to them. Um, however, there are other negatives as well. So, for example, um, because they're taking part in an interview, they're going to be aware that they're being researched, okay? Um, and they might, because they spent a lot more time with this researcher, again, they might quite like the research and they might want to impress them even more because they spent a bit more time with them. Um, there is an argument that because they've built up a closer relationship, they're much more likely to be open and honest, okay? But some would say, actually, yeah, they might want to impress them more because they know them better. Uh, and then there is still that issue because of the time spent conducting unstructured interviews that the researcher themselves gets a bit close to the participant and loses their objectivity as well. So what I'd like you to do is have a go at evaluating the validity of closed questionnaires. Um, you know, they can be um, sent by post or email. Um, so use those issues and say, you know, are they going to be valid or not and why? So the last thing I want to talk to you about today is um, sort of validity versus ethical issues. Uh, and I've given you a seesaw because quite often it's a bit of a trade-off between the two. So often research that's really ethical, such as questionnaires, can be low in validity. So questionnaires are highly ethical because you can make them anonymous, they can be confidential, people don't have to fill them out so they've got the right to withdraw. Um, people can opt out of questions that might upset them so they don't cause psychological harm. Um, however, People can easily lie in questionnaires. Um, they're not with a researcher, for example, so they can be low in validity. Um, or research that's really high in validity, like covert observation, does have lots of ethical issues. So covert observation, because it's covert, there's no informed consent. They don't know they're being researched. However, as a result, their behaviour is going to be much more natural and true, so it's much more valid. 
So sociologists have to decide early on what their priorities are, okay, and if their work they're doing is crucial enough to be unethical, so investigating criminal gangs, for example. Thanks for listening.